um, I did not know that the testing portion also included report writing and that report writing is, it, it, it takes a long time to learn. And if you're not a good writer, or if you don't like to write, you this might not be the job for you. <laughs> it takes a lot of training and um, it's a big part of the job. I love that you bring that up um, because I think for me, like going into clinical psychology, I didn't realize that part either. And it, it is, it does take a while do do you type your reports or do you di dictate your reports you dictate your reports no <laughs> <laughs> so i don't but when i was in my practicum site the neuropsychologist all of them would dictate all of them would like literally have a recorder they would dictate it and then they would send the file to someone that would type it up what is up fam welcome back to the channel my name is phil sarpon this is phil's guide to psyd this channel is dedicated to all things psychology wellness and graduate school today we have a very special guest we're going to be talking with a school psychologist and talking about all things school psychology now i'm really really excited to get into this interview because i know a lot of you guys have reached out about the specifics of school psychology and how to become a school psychologist and so in this interview tiffany is going to share her tips her guides her advice and some of her experiences about being a school psychologist. Now, I also think this is a really important conversation because in the world of clinical psychology, there's actually not a lot of things that we learn specifically about the school psychology side. And so for me, in this interview, I actually learned a ton about school psychology that I didn't know about before. And even though they're both in the realm of psychology, the way to kind of go about these tracks, clinical psychology and school psychology, is radically different. And so hopefully this video will provide some clarity and some guidance into potentially for you guys what you might want to do or what you might want to look into when you're researching these two fields. Before we jump into that interview, I do want to mention that the community that we have on YouTube is growing. If you guys want to become a member and join the community, this is kind of like a Patreon, but it's right on YouTube, so you don't have to go to a different website. You can get a lot of access to videos that haven't been released yet and to other interviews that we've done that we haven't released yet. So if you want to see behind the scenes to some other videos and things like that, you can go ahead and become a member. So without further ado, we're just going to jump right into the interview. Hey, Tiffany, how are you doing today? Hey, Phil, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking and thanks for having me here. Absolutely. It's been um, it's been something I've been really looking forward to. I know that this is something that my audience has requested to talk to a school psychologist. And so like I'm really just I think even for me selfishly, I'm really excited for this interview. So really appreciate the time. I was going to say um, you're definitely going to have to join my channel because there's so many people that are really interested in clinical psych. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime I am there. So to jump right into it, I'd love to know, you know, for you, when was the moment that you realized that you wanted to become a school psychologist? So I don't have any like amazing story where, you know, I, my life was saved by a school psychologist or I knew a school psychologist like growing up. I think for a lot of people, we just kind of stumble upon school psychology. Um, a lot of people don't really know what it is until like college or maybe post-college, which I think is a big issue. You know, we're trying to really spread awareness of the field because there's a huge shortage. Um, for me, I um, majored in psych and business. And um, after graduating, you know, with a bachelor's in psychology, you really can't do much. Um, you either go to grad school or you try to find any job, right? <laughs> and I looked um, for a job. I was able to find something called ABA. Um, applied behavioral analysis, and I was able to become a therapist, not really knowing what it was, but I knew um, I got to work with kids, a lot of kids on the spectrum, and I got to do work that's related to psychology. Um, so I did that for a little bit. I worked in a private school as like a program director for a little bit, and I was like, I need something more. So I started researching. And um, at the private school, I did a lot of um, admin work. I was um, hiring teachers, working with staff members, um, talking to parents, helping students with like behavior, social, emotional um, 
difficulties. And so when I found school psychology, like I read the description, I was like, this might be perfect for me. You know, it's a blend of education, psychology. I love the school setting. Um, I applied, I got in and I was like, of course I'm going to go. Like I got into grad school. I don't really know what it is. I'm going to (laughs) go. And that's basically how it started. It's, it's crazy. Um, I think a lot of people don't really know what they're getting into. Um, So I think this kind of uh, content is really important. That is, that is so cool. I, I love that story in terms of like, it wasn't necessarily something that you knew right away that you wanted to get into, but you were in some type of similar field and it got you exposed to it. And then it kind of clicked and now you, now you do what you do. So that's amazing. And what for you, like, I guess even going through school psychology, like what for you, was like maybe the attractive thing about it that kind of pulled you into that? I really think it's like the education piece. Like, okay, I don't know if I've shared this on my channel, but I did apply for a lot of clinical psych programs right after college, but I had no research experience. I didn't really know how to apply for grad school, what kind of experience I what kind of experiences I needed. So I got rejected to them all. And I was like, oh my God, like grad school's not for me. But then after having some experience, I think you kind of learn what you're good at, what you're um, passionate about, what you enjoy doing. And after working in a school, I I realized, you know, I think education is where I want to be, but I really enjoy psychology. So it's really that blend of the two fields. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so for you, take us through like, what would your typical day look like as a school psychologist? So you can probably ask any school psychologist and they will say there is no typical day. Um, (laughs) Every day is so different. I think because you're working in a school, um, you can have a plan for what your day is going to look like because you have so many things to do. But there is that like flexibility in a lot of your days so you can prioritize what you need to do. Um, But things pop up, you know, you might have um, crisis management Um, behaviors, students that you have to see, maybe staff members. There's just so many things that can happen in a school. Um, So I guess if I can try to explain a typical day. Um, Today, I guess this morning, I scheduled to test a student for a couple hours. And this is if the student is present and if they don't have like any major tests, like everything has to work out. Um, so I tested the student for three hours. Um, I got a quick bite to eat, scored my test. I sent out rating scales for other students, sat in a meeting, um, prepped for like uh, a counseling group that I have um, next week. And then, um, yeah, I, I do that with a couple of the counselors, which I love about my job as well. Um, just being able to work with so many other amazing professionals. Um, Yeah, I mean, and then maybe I might like film like a five minute TikTok for my school psych account. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay, no, that's awesome. I I feel like it's so interesting. Like when I talk about clinical psychology with people and then also like I I do have friends that are school psychologists too. And it's interesting, like you have these two fields that are related to psychology, but I feel like we don't know anything about each other. At least for me, I feel like I didn't really know that much about it. And so it's it's cool to kind of hear your perspective and to kind of see what you're going through. And that's awesome. And so I, one question I do have, is there any like therapy involved uh, with the, the kids that you treat or is it mostly like the testing and the assessment side? That's a great question. Um, So we are sort of trained in counseling. I think I have like two classes and we're expected to do counseling in some districts. And this is another thing about our jobs. We might have the title school psychologist, but depending on which district, which school, which um, state you're working in, your role might look completely different. Um, Some people, they only test and write reports. Some people, they only do counseling, but I would say the majority of school psychologists, they'll provide counseling services, but not therapy because our goal and like for our counseling sessions is to send the student back to class, make sure they have coping skills so that they can get back to class. Like our goal is to make sure that they're getting their education. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That makes so much sense. And so for you, uh, your program, how long was your program? So it was a total of three years. Um, I had I got a master's plus certificate of advanced graduate studies, which is equivalent to an EDS. 
um, three years, including the one year internship. Got you. Okay. Okay. And then was the one year internship, was it, was it paid or was it just kind of part of the program in terms of your study? So the internship, you're kind of like on your own. You might have like one class per semester where you meet up with your cohort and um, you have to kind of finish your portfolio, maybe talk about like case studies, um, but it's more like a, a check-in, right? Um, your internship is kind of like your full-time job. Um, I would say some people are paid a full salary, but those people might be expected to do more. I know some states don't pay at all, which I think is a huge issue because if you're working full-time, you you have to get paid something, right? Like you have to live. Um, I got paid a stipend of $20,000, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but yeah, that's how it usually goes. You either get a stipend or really nothing. Okay. And then once you got done, did you have to, was there a licensure exam? Was there a certification or some type of exam that you had to take? Um, for most states, you might have to take the praxis, which is pretty simple, straightforward. I studied maybe like a, a couple weeks and it was fine. Um, you just have to make sure you turn in all your paperwork for your internship, all the practicum hours. Um, you have to make sure you went to like a, a program that's that meets all the standards for your state. And so again, this de depends on where you work. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. That makes sense. This may seem like a weird question, but obviously I know school psychologists work in schools, but are there any other settings that you could work in, whether it's in administrative roles in other different organizations or other different places? That is also a great question. I would say like the majority of them work in schools, public schools usually. Um, some might work in private or charter, but I know a lot of like private schools don't have school psychologists. Um, we actually get a lot of private school students that come to the public-based school for testing or whatever you know other needs they have. Um, school psychologists can also work in private settings. Um, in some states, they're able to open their own practice if they have um, additional certifications, maybe like a couple more hours of... Um, like practicum or, you know, like field work hours, or I think some states, they just allow them to do so. Um, typically, you need like a PhD or a PsyD to do, you know, private practice on your own. I also know a lot of school psychologists, um, they're um, psychometrists, and so they'll do like a lot of testing and clinical settings. Um, so I worked at Children's National in DC for one of my um, internship rotations. And there are psychometrists that only do testing. They don't analyze the data. They don't write the report. They'll just do the testing and then report it to the neuropsych. And so there's a lot of different opportunities. I think sometimes you have to get, get kind of creative. Um, like maybe like the juvenile system, you can probably go and do te testing over there, clinical settings. So and admin, like you mentioned, um, we do have school psychologists that are um, kind of like our supervisors. They're not in the school setting, but then they'll help consult or um, like lead meetings for us. Okay, wow. It, it's, it's cool because I, I hear so much diversity and kind of like you talked about, like every day could be different. You're doing different things. You might see the same population, but there's all these different ways that it all kind of connects together. I'm wondering if, let's say, there's a, a high school student or college student who is thinking about school psychology, what are some of the tips or advice that you would give them? Because it does seem like there's a lot of different options that they can take. How do they kind of like filter all that information and kind of figure out what they need to do to, to get to where they want to go? So, hmm. Definitely like doing your own research to start, I think is important. So, you know, go to Google, go to YouTube, go and find some sources. NASP is an amazing resource as a National Association of School Psychologists. They have like amazing, like simple handouts, just talking about what school psychologists do, what kind of degrees you can get, the programs that are approved by them. Very, very helpful information. I also tell people to maybe reach out to districts that are surrounding them, maybe reach out to school psychologists to see if you can either shadow or I don't know, um, have a call with them to ask questions. I think that's really awesome to to have that like one on one, like firsthand, you know, interview. Um, and experience wise, it's really hard to get an internship in school psychology unless you're in grad school already. So, I tell people to find experience either in a school setting or working with children or any 
um, educational research. Gotcha. Okay. That's, yeah, that's really, really helpful for yourself. It, like, where do you see kind of your career as a school psychologist, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now? I honestly don't know. Um, right now, this is my second year working as a school psychologist after internship. I could totally see myself maybe in like a more like leadership role while still being in the schools because you know there's different tiers right now i still love like working with the students and all the teachers um there's it's just it keeps me very busy and um it makes me think a lot i think that's good um but i'm also interested in so many different things so you're gonna have to stay tuned <laughs> No, I love that. I love that. And honestly, we'll definitely put down some links for all of the resources that you're mentioning. And then also your YouTube channel. I think I've been checking out your YouTube channel, which is a source of information for me in terms of like understanding school psychology. And so I think the audience would really kind of appreciate like what the information that you put out too, I think is really helpful in terms of helping people figure out what they want to do. So thank you for providing those videos i think they're yeah i think they're great in that way thank you <laughs> uh one thing i definitely do want to talk about is like for you I, you kind of mentioned it but what's probably the one thing that you love about the work that you do i think my answer for what i love and like the most challenging part of the job it changes really like every few months as i get to learn the job more and as i gain more experiences i would say right now it's definitely my love for like being in the schools um you just get to work with so many children you have access to so many kids and you can make such a big impact and school psychs don't just work with you know kids one-on-one -on -one testing you also can work with school systems and so you're working with administrators you're trying to make systems level change implementing interventions for all students not just special education students so i think that's really amazing um and also just being able to work as a team with so many people, you get to learn from them and also um, provide the best services in that way. Um, and it's just, there's never a boring day. There's never a dull moment. So I love that. I, I think you bring up a really good point about some of the systems. I, I know for me, like growing up, I didn't, I don't think I interacted with school psychologists. Like, I don't think I had school psychologists in my middle school or elementary school or even high school. And so for me, like, I didn't really learn about school psychology probably until college. And I think it's, I think there's such an integral part of the school system in general. I wonder for you, like, what are some of the maybe systemic changes that you've been able to see or maybe even be a part of in terms of how, whether it's funding or whether it's uh, helping students uh, learning disabilities, uh, what, what type of things have you been able to see in, in that type of systemic change? So like I said, I haven't been in the school system that long, but even in like the past, uh, the few years that I've, you know, been in the schools, I've really seen a bigger push for mental health. And I, I don't know if that's like coming down from like our government or like a couple of people in office or maybe like our communities, but we obviously know that mental health is so important. Um, and there's just so much data out there about that. And so, you know, you mentioned funding. There's definitely a lot more funding for um, mental health professionals in schools. So there's a lot more positions open for school psychologists, social workers, counselors. Um, the issue is that there's a shortage of school psychologists. And so there might be a lot of vacancies, but not enough people to hire. And that there's yeah that becomes like a whole system of issues like do we have enough grad schools are we accepting enough students do we have enough supervisors for internship we can definitely make like a whole list of, of things that we should probably look at and talk about <laughs> oh my gosh yeah i mean you're bringing up some really good points i feel like that's even just in general like a mental health issue right just in terms of the lack of either therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist especially in rural areas. Mm. But I love the fact that, uh, I mean, for me, I, I feel like I've been able to see the difference that school psychologists make. When, when I went through my first practicum site, it was neuropsychology focused. And we did a lot of, we had a lot of referrals for children who would have either ADHD or dyslexia, and we would go through testing and, you know, give recommendations either to the parents or to the schools. And so sometimes we would be talking, you know, uh, directly to the schools in terms of what they could do 
to provide for the child. And the schools that we were able to interact with that had school psychologists already there, I feel like for me personally, it made things so much easier uh, because they were able to take the data, the testing. They were also able to kind of say the same things that we were saying to the parents. They were able to say them to the school. They were able to kind of advocate for the student. And so I was able to kind of see a little bit of that interaction. And so I feel like, yeah, some of the systemic things that you're talking about, whether it's uh, coming from mental health professionals, telling the schools that they should think about mental health more or, uh, or from parents or from whoever, right? I, I, I feel like I'm starting to see kind of that trend as well. So that's pretty cool. And then what for you would you say, I guess you kind of mentioned it, but what would you say is challenging uh, in terms of your profession? I think for me personally right now is um, definitely all the hats that we wear. Um, you know, we always talk about how it's a good thing that we can focus on mental health and also, you know, provide counseling services, do all these different things instead of just the traditional testing, report writing, you know, kind of like gatekeepers of special education, right? Um, I think that's great. But then that means we have to figure out how to do everything within the same amount of time. Um, our caseloads are probably not changing. Um, hopefully it changes in the future. But I think just figuring out um, how to use my time efficiently and figuring out like a rhythm so that I can focus on, you know, all the areas that we're trained in and the needs of the school while also doing things that I enjoy. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot to kind of juggle and manage and learn, especially the first few years. And I think a lot of um, school psychologists that I've talked to, like Facebook groups online, they say it takes like three to five years to really become comfortable in your role. Wow, that's really interesting. Are you working with other school psychologists in your school or is it just you as the main person? So in my school, I'm the only school psychologist, but I still think that's a blessing because there's a lot of school psychologists with maybe three campuses, five campuses, a whole district. It's really crazy, especially, you know, you talked about rural um, areas. There might be one school psychologist for the whole district. Um, and so they might have like a central office and then they'll go out to different schools and do testing and maybe hold meetings virtually. Um, the fact that I have one campus, I, there's still like 1,100 students, but I get my own office. I don't have to move around. I can keep all my, you know, test kits with me, leave my laptop at work if I want. Um, so that's like a blessing. Um, but definitely like it's, it's not the norm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I cannot imagine having a whole district that you have to kind of go back and forth on. And I mean, yeah. So that that's really good to know. I, I think uh, in terms of people who are thinking about this profession, you know, you talk about the pros and the cons and of course, kind of making the best decision, you know, for anyone who's looking into this profession. Is there anything else, any other advice that you would give for students who are maybe looking to apply? Uh, perhaps uh, you kind of talked a little bit about just making sure like researching what they really want to do. But uh, what other advice would you say you have for students who are looking to apply? Um, I think when you're looking for a program, I think there's certain things that you want to consider. Um, and I, going back to your last question, I don't think I quite answered it. Um, there are a lot of other school psychologists in my district that I can consult with. And our supervisor is also a school psychologist. And so that's really, really nice because whenever I have questions, I can go to them. And since we're in the same district, you know, we use the same paperwork, all the um, same regulations. So that's really nice. Um, and we meet monthly as a department. I think there's like 80 of us. And then um, in even bigger districts in my area, I think there's like 200 school psychologists, which is a lot compared to like the ones that have one or two. Um, so when you're looking for a program, I would definitely start with a type of degree. So do you want a specialist degree or do you want a doctoral degree? And, you know, that includes a PhD, PsyD. Um, and I guess the pay usually in public schools is going to be very similar. doesn't matter what degree you have, maybe like a thousand dollar difference. Um, but it I think it depends on what you want to do with the, the degree afterwards. If you want to do private practice, if you want to work in higher education, be a professor, you definitely want to go for your doctorate. Um, if you want to work in schools, you are probably fine with a specialist degree. And for the doctorate, so is there's different types of doctorates too, right? There's the 
I think you mentioned this ID or the PhD. Mm -hmm. Is there also an ED as well? I guess there is an ED. I'm okay. not sure if they're able to practice. Probably if you if there's like a master's in school psychology with the EDD, maybe you can. Probably gotcha. depends on all of that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And so I imagine the doctorate would just be like you probably could do more research, I'm assuming, maybe teaching in other school psychology programs, maybe the supervision side. Is that kind of aligned with the doctorate a little bit? It's probably going to be a lot more intense, obviously a lot longer, more expensive, unless like it's fully paid for. Um, typically, there's going to be a lot more research. And then the internship is also longer. So for an EDS, you're looking at like a total of three years. For a doc, you're probably looking at five to six years. Um, and then also, you know, when you're considering programs, you're looking at like the location, the cost, the faculty, the specialty of the program. Um yeah, all of that stuff. What about for funding? Like what for you, were you working part time or were you just a full time student? Um, so I was able to work three years before I started grad school. So I was able to save up a lot of money during that time. And I also worked basically 40 hours during my first year of grad school, which really kicked my ass. Um, I worked at the private school part time. And I was like, oh, like, I need something more flexible. So I um, worked at a restaurant for the first time in my life on weekends. So I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, while planning a wedding. It, it's definitely, it's doable because usually grad school classes will be in the evening, um, but they typically expect you to spend a lot of time in classes and studying, um, working on papers. There's obviously, you know, there's a lot of reading in grad school. Um and then some programs, even like specialist degree programs, they will offer um, assistantship positions where, you know, you might work like 20, 30 hours um, on campus um, and they'll pay for either room board, some tuition. That's pretty good. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, it sounds like because uh, some of the same opportunities that I think are in my program sound very similar in terms of whether it might be scholarships or assistantships or mm -hmm. um, different things like that. So that's, that's also really good to know. Is there uh, any, anything that you wish you would have known before you got into this career? Yeah. I mean, I wish I knew what I was getting into, but if I wanted to be more specific, probably um, the role in function of a school psychologist, which sounds crazy because you would expect someone to know when they're applying. Um, I did not know that the testing portion also included report writing and that report writing is, it, it, it takes a long time to learn. And if you're not a good writer, or if you don't like to write, you this might not be the job for you. <laughs> it takes a lot of training and um, it's a big part of the job. I love that you bring that up. Um, because I think for me, like going into clinical psychology, I didn't realize that part either. And it, it is, it does take a while. Do, do you type your reports or do you di dictate your reports? You dictate your reports? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, but when I was in my practicum site, the neuropsychologist, all of them would dictate. All of them would like literally have a recorder, they would dictate it, and then they would send the file to someone that would type it up for them. Wow. And it was like some type of, you know, like a recording service or whatever. And they were like, yeah, I've, they were like, I've never typed up a report in like 30 years or something like that. They're like, I always dictate my reports. And I get it because they have such a huge caseload mm -hmm. that it just, and they have so many kids that they have to see and test that it's just was the best thing for them i only got to try it once but even that was like kind of weird because i was like this is so weird like speaking into a mic so yeah you said so you've never no how was that for you like how do you synthesize everything and make sure everything flows and sounds right that was the hardest part for me because when i did it I just felt like I was speaking in circles. I felt like, yeah, and like in the recording, you can say, Hey, can you like cut out that part that I just said? Or can you like start over? But like, you'll have to literally say like, okay, next paragraph, 
and like next you know what i mean and it's like when you're talking to siri <laughs> yeah literally and you know the person who types it up they'll send it back to you to see if it's okay and then you can still edit it and stuff like that and just kind of like read it over but the neuropsychologist that i worked with i guess they had just gotten so good at it just with practice that literally the way that they typed they were able to dictate it in the same format which i feel like is such a <laughs> such a huge skill because my brain would just not it was just not working that way <laughs> so do you think it saved them time i do i do think so i i think they were honestly able to see like if they typically we'd get two people that we'd have to test a day um they would take either like two to four hours each and i feel like within a week you know they'd see like 10 kids or so they were probably able to get eight reports dictated and finished wow, that's pretty good which yeah and so the turnaround was really helpful especially for parents who needed who were kind of like time conflicted um but yeah i just for me and i had never heard about it until i was in this practicum site but yeah so <laughs> i don't know so you've never you've never tried it you've, you've never seen anyone i've never heard of it until right now that's wow that, it's just it sounds so absurd to me because i need everything like they need everything to like look perfect, like the formatting yeah. and, oh, yeah. you know, everything has to sound cohesive and, you know, you have to synthesize everything. So I can't imagine dictating yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like for me, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to go into the neuropsych route and do a lot of the testing and report writing. But I feel like if I was, if I did go that route, I feel like I would be a traditional typer and synthesize everything just because that's just how my brain works. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to each their own, right? I <laughs> Yeah, I know that's amazing. And literally it would take one of them like 45 minutes to dictate the whole report. Like it was pretty quick. It, it, it just, yeah, it was pretty incredible to watch. <laughs> wow. So yeah, you learned something, <laughs> mm -hmm. you learned something new. Um, one of my last few questions that I have was, you know, I think in general, like, thank you so much for kind of painting this picture of school psychology. I'd love to know, were there any, like, for you in terms of differences between school psychology and clinical psychology, anything that you knew about personally that you were like, oh, yeah, these are how these two things are different, just to kind of give the audience a little bit of a comparison or similarity? So I, I like jotted down a couple of things, but I would love for you to jump in. And um, a lot of the information that I have is from, it's a lot of it's like anecdotal. Like I worked in the neuropsych department. So um, I have some information from there. And then our grad program, we were kind of housed in the same um, clinic as the clinical psych students. And so um, we used the same clinic, had a lot of the same clients, but they would obviously do more, you know, therapy and, um, yeah, we would have like classes in the, in the same building. Um, I would say like similarity wise, I think we use a lot of the same instruments for testing. Um, but the way we use that information is very different. So I know a lot of clinical psychologists, they provide diagnoses using the DSM-5. School psychologists, they don't use a DSM. We use um, whatever the Department of Education gives us as guidelines and we identify um, different areas of disabilities. I think there's 13 or 14 categories and we'll do the testing and it, students also need to have an educational impact from their disability to qualify for services so i think that's a huge difference and i guess kind of going along with that we have no idea um, about like insurance billing any of that <laughs> we had to do a couple in grad school because we were in the clinic setting um i know there's like different codes i don't know if there's like people that do it for you but that's like a whole other world <laughs> Honestly, it's a whole nother world for us too, because they don't really go through that stuff in grad school. I learned a little bit about it in my practicum sites just from like watching, but even then it's so, it's just so confusing to me. <laughs> like, and, um, the site that I worked at, they did have specialists that would handle all of the coding and billing and stuff like that, which That's is, good. I think a huge gods. Yeah. Cause I feel like it would just take up so much time in terms mm -hmm. of the clinical work and then doing that on top of it too. But yeah, I, I think that's pretty on point. I'm assuming like for some of the instruments, the waste, the whisk, 
probably are. So that's another thing. We only work with children, I guess, up to the age of 22, uh, if yeah. if they qualify for those services. But it's typically up to a high school. Um, so I know a lot of clinical psychs, they also have the opportunity to work with adults, which I think is amazing. I can't imagine like the additional training that you guys would need. Um, and I think kind of going along with that, I feel like you guys would deal with more like psychopathology. Like, of course, we see it in schools, but we're more focused on how that impacts their education. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a very like specialized focus in that. But it's cool because that just means that you guys are you guys are the experts in that like in, in terms of your expertise like there's a lot of ground that you guys have in that area so i think one thing for me that i've also realized is just how like sometimes i don't know if you feel the same way but clinical psychology in some ways feels isolating in terms of like if you're in a private practice it could just be you if even mm -hmm. if you're in a group practice you're still just seeing patients one on one. So sometimes there's just not a lot of interaction with other professionals or colleagues and stuff like that. And one thing that's been nice in the practicum side that I'm in now is that it's in a hospital. So there's just way more interaction with other psychologists. But I wonder for you what it's like in terms of the isolation piece, or is that something just because you are that you have other school psychologists there that you don't really feel that or how, how do you kind of describe that piece? I would love to work with more school psychologists in my building just because like there's just certain things that only school psychologists would understand. There are other mental health professionals in the building, but it's just, it's not the same. Um, like, you know, different lingo that we use for um, testing or special education um, or things just like psychology related. Um, so that would be really nice, but you still get to work with a lot of different people. I think in terms of like job specific duties, it could be very isolating because you might be the only one, like the only expert and you would have to kind of reach out to people outside. Right. Um, but you have a lot of opportunities to work with people. And I think socially, like, you know, there's other people there. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that totally makes sense. Yeah. I, it's one of those things like, it's so focused that unless you're in doing what you are doing, like, yeah, it's not, there's similarities, but there's some key differences in terms of what you're doing compared to other mental health professionals. So I totally, I totally agree with that as well. All right, Tiffany. So one last couple few things I'd love to know for you, and this is something that I do for all of the, the guests that we have is that I'd love to know for you, what you do for your self care. I love this question. Thanks for asking. Um, so I, a year ago, I had a baby. Um, and with that, you know, there's just so many changes that come like physically, mentally, just, you know, you're responsible for another being. Um, and I gained a lot of weight and I just, I've been so sedentary and I starting maybe like six, seven months ago, I started orange theory, which is um, like a workout class, right? And half of it's cardio, which I do enjoy running, um, but I'm not good at it. And the classes really kick my ass, um, but it's been really, really good. I think not just physically, but for my mental health. Um, I think when you're working out, you're able to kind of just focus on that, like focus on the moment. Um, you're really not worrying about anything else. I'm just trying to like finish my run without like falling off the treadmill, <laughs> trying to finish my set. Um, so that's been really, really good for me. I mean, also spending time with loved ones. I think that like social interaction, those relationships are so important. And um, along with that, I have a dog and I think having a dog is just a great way to boost your serotonin, like keep you happy, calm. Um, even though my dog is night, she's, she's a good cuddler. So <laughs> Those are a couple of things that I do. Oh, I love that. I'm jealous because I I want a dog so bad. I'm hoping in the next year or so, but that's amazing. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's cool too, because self-care is really one of those things that you can make it your own and it can be like either a challenge, right? Like a good type of challenge in terms of like maybe doing something that you've never done before, but you know that it's good for you or something that you love to do, right? Whether it's like social interaction and stuff like that. So those are, those are really great things to hear. Um, 
anything else that we should know about school psychology that you'd like to tell us? I think when it comes to working in a school setting, there's just so much opportunity for you to do things that you're passionate about, as long as you're, you know, completing your duties, right? Whether that's testing your the caseload that you have. Um, and one of those things that I enjoy doing is um, taking around our therapy dog in our school. And so we have one coming in twice a week this school year. Last year, I think it was three times a week. And we give out passes during lunch for students to come and hang out with the dog after they eat. And all the students and staff love the dog. It's just so funny. Like everyone's like face and their like voice changes when they see, see the dog. And I think it's amazing. I love that. My first practicum site had a therapy dog as well. And I, I feel like they're a game changer in terms of, especially for clients who maybe are apprehensive about therapy or even for kids too. Like, I just feel like they, they just do something different. I don't know what it is, but yeah, that's, oh, that's so cool. Love to hear that. Well, honestly, Tiffany, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your thoughts and your story about how you became a school psychologist. And I know my audience really appreciates it. Uh, We'd love to have you back in the future. Uh, You provided so much good information. And so I think it's, it's really, really, really thankful and grateful for just everything that you shared today. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, People can reach out to me via my social media. I don't know if there's a place that you can put all that information out there, but yeah, I would love to answer any questions, interact with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll leave all of the links down below that you can, people can check out your social media, YouTube channel, Instagram, all of those things. So thank you again. And uh, we look forward to the next time.